Okay, my name's Erin, and I am an artist by vocation, um, but I am married to a campus minister, and I have been a campus minister at one point, um, and uh, so I feel like I have been, oh, come on in. I, I am usually in the five to 10 minute late crowd, okay, so I have great. no, you're yeah, good. Cool. You're yeah. totally fine. Here, or do you, want us to sit right you can in front sit right here in front of me. I don't mind. I guess we can keep here. <laughs> Either way. No, you're fine. <laughs> um, I was just saying I'm Aaron, and I'm an artist. Um, but I'm also in ministry still. Um, and so I feel like I'm y uniquely placed in this spot to talk about um, art and how it engages the world with the gospel. Um, and I'm going to try to stay on task, but uh, I have a manuscript just in case I get off track. So um, if this topic is so much bigger than even just this little snippet that I'm sharing, so if something that I say or something that you're already thinking about sparks something and you want to grab me and get coffee or or even just like continue a conversation through messenger or however like I'm happy to be available for that um, but let's get into it um, I feel like we need to go back a little bit context is always so important and so uh, I want to go back a little bit and I don't want to spend too much time on art history because sometimes that can get muddy but I want to give us like a a starting point to now so that we can have a better understanding of how to talk about the culture now that we're trying to engage with the gospel um, because significant things happen in the past that affect what is going on right now. So um, we're going to start in the beginning. And here's another thing about me. I'm terrible at PowerPoint, so I just make my own PowerPoint. Okay. So um, we're going to start in the very beginning, which is in the beginning God created. And I love that the very first thing we learn of the character of God is that he, um, he is a creator. Before we learn of his laws, his righteousness, or his love, we see that he, he makes good things. Um, and then in Genesis 1.26, uh, the first thing we learn is about humanity is that we're created in his image. A lot of these things I have found all week this week have been continual continually repeating in a lot of the other sessions, which I'm glad that we're like-minded in this. Um, so two verses later, after we learn that we are created in his image, uh, humanity is given an invitation to be co-creators with God in beautifying and cultivating and developing the earth. Um, a great book that talks about that is Garden City by John Mark Comer, and it kind of, kind of gives that picture. Um, CW was talking about like a we start in a garden, we end in a city, and how we have this this call to like go make make a city, make culture, um, and that, that's that's that book, and it's really good. Um, but as we know in the story, nothing stays as God intended it, and in Genesis three six, uh, we see beauty is used and abused by Satan. Um, he uses it to entice and trap Eve in sin, and now everything that was created beautiful is also now broken and history continues to live out this broken relationship. We see it play out in the relationship between how beauty was intended to be and our visual culture and our relationship with God. Um, moving along a little bit, in the Old Testament, uh, we see in Exodus uh, that there is um, a large importance placed on like excellence in building the tabernacle, like building the house of of where God is going to dwell. Um, and it, in Exodus 31, one through six, we see craftsmen and artists um, that it says are being filled with the spirit of God with skill and ability and knowledge and all kinds of crafts. Um, even though I'm an artist, I feel like sometimes I question like, why does this matter? Um, and I got a good reminder yesterday in Marty's workshop of like why vocation matters. Um, excellence in craft is important. Um, we see it here in this building of, of the tabernacle, even down to like the fabrics that were used and the, and the type of metal that was gonna be used in the lamp stands. I mean, it's, it's incredibly specific and, and excellent. 
And that points to God's excellent character, and it visually reminds us of God's beauty and of his majesty. I'm going to get into more into like that idea of what beauty is a little bit later, but, um, but we see even in the beginning this call to excellence um, in what we make. And in the New Testament, um, I feel like we're given a, a continued call to excellence, but also um, a call to multiplication. So it's kind of this, this twofold um, idea. We have verses like 2 Timothy 2.21 talking about uh, believers being instruments for noble purposes, made holy and useful, and prepared to do any good work. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.14-21, through 21, we're, we're called new creations, um, and we're called ambassadors for Christ in the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, and then, of course, Matthew 28.19 directing us to multiplication of the kingdom as we are going. So in my context, I see that as um, I am filled with a call to create excellent visual culture and to be a blessing to the world and to be multiplication minded. Um, that is bringing people closer to Jesus and into the kingdom as I go about creating the things that I create. Um, now here's where we're going to get into a little bit of uh, art history and um, that fun stuff. So keep in mind, context-wise, art and religion have been partners in an ongoing dialogue about the meaning of life, about um, suffering and evils, love, beauty, eternity. Um, and before the 1500s, before the printing press, um, the words of God were not primarily read, they were spoken, and they were seen through visual arts, music, and dance. So of course, there have always been secular versions of, create, of art, of visual culture, um, but it's important to note that, uh, oh, I have a pretty picture for this one too. Um, the desire and drive within us to create, if pushed out of the church, will always find places to be expressed outside of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, so even though there are some really beautiful uh, places where art and, and religion, uh, art and faith mingle together, there are also places um, at the same time where um, art is separate from faith. So just keep that in your mind. Um, the early church used symbols, sometimes even pagan symbols, uh, to convey a new transformed meaning on how to live and follow Jesus. Rob spoke a bit about this yesterday morning, about how the church has always drawn on the culture of the day, um, of that time, uh, to connect people to God. And really, when you think about it, it's kind of a really beautiful picture of, of transforming something. It's kind of like the work that Jesus does is taking something and transforming it and making it holy. So it's a pretty cool side thought. Um, but uh, when the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, uh, we begin to see this return to excellence in our places of worship. So I made my own version of uh, a uh, timeline here because I want to look specifically at how art and faith have come together and separated at various times. So um, we have in the beginning and we have art kind of like art is this squiggly line that kind of does weird things over here. Um, and then I have like the main bullet points of things we're gonna hit here. That main line uh, is kind of faith and it splits in several places. But so we have this intermingling of, of uh, art being primarily um, religious in use. Okay, so around, like before the Middle Ages, but also I'm talking kind of all in this Middle Ages medieval art time period. Um, after the Roman Empire adopts Christianity, you have this, like, um, I also want to specify, I'm talking about Western art. That's kind of my niche here, just for clarification. Um, they start creating these uh, excellent places of worship where they're large and elaborate, and um, they're created with the intent to walk in and raise your eyes up towards the heavens to almost force a posture of worship. Um, uh, they want you. They want it to just be so magnificent and breathtaking that you are confronted with how um, magnificent and breathtaking our God is. Um, it's intentional. 
Uh, the stained glass windows told stories of scripture. They were used as a sort of flashcard for sharing doctrine and um, inspiring imitation. Uh, again, they were learning through pictures and through stories and through those visual elements. Um, it should be said that some of the art within the church was also there just purely for adornment, which I think is a fantastic idea that I'll talk about a little more later. Um, music and dance were a part of the services as well until about the Middle Ages when dancing was too closely associated with pagan rituals um, and so it was banned from the church. And again, the idea of if you kick something out of the church, it will find a place to be expressed outside of it. And that is the time that Carnival was created um, when that separation of dance and the church happened. Um, so. Uh, medieval art is typically marked with dark imagery, but its primary function was religious. So the subject matter typically was biblical or classic mythology, um, but the purpose was to help explain and and um, kind of a, there was a divine source for the things that happened in life. That was the, the kind of content to the art of that time. And the multiplication aspect was continuing through trade, um, craftsmen and apprenticeships. There was this multiplication focus of bringing artisans in to learn the craft, to learn the excellence of the craft that can then be multiplied and continue, continue the um, cycle. Um, artisan guilds, apprenticeships. Um, so next comes the Renaissance. And this is the part that kind of gets me a little more excited. Not that the other stuff wasn't good, but um, Several major things are happening in, the re in this period. So first, there's a massive shift within visual culture and culture in general, um, where people are no longer looking to a divine source for answers. They're starting to look within themselves. Um, so man has now become the center of the universe and of human experience. And man is the, um, that's, sorry. Man has now become the, the measuring stick, the standard by which everything is applied to. And that idea is going to keep, keep going even until today. Um, so there's a push on, uh, in individualism and realism happening in art and um, both in and outside of the church. Uh, the Catholic Church is continuing to build beautiful and magnificent cathedrals um, as allegories to heaven. There's a cathedral in Paris that I've been to where, not it's not in Paris, it's in France, but I've been to it and it's like literally every stone was thoughtfully and strategically created to be an allegory of heaven. They used squares as the thing because it was like a perfect kind of uh, building block shape and uh, the stained glass windows. I mean, like the whole thing. It's called Chartres, Chartres Cathedral in France. Look it up. It's like really fascinating how specific they were because they wanted people to feel like they were in the presence of, of God in heaven upon entering the church. It's insane. Um, but the church is also, also during this time the primary patron of the arts. So all of the art work and paintings and uh, altar pieces and um, uh, you know, Sistine Chapel, uh, architecture was happening obviously outside of the church as well, but really the advances and the, the big push was from the church uh, being patrons of the art. Um, and along with this though, we also are starting to have corruption within the church and um, a, just a, a visual propaganda and greed and right smack in the middle of the renaissance we have the um the protestant reformation so that's that's what i have here and during this time we have a split in the church so um what happens after the this the church splits is you have the roman catholic church that kind of digs their heels into that visual um history that they have created or that visual context culture that they've created and they they push their their patronage they get bigger and and better and kind of like sink into that um, that mentality that they have of visual arts within the church and um, the Protestant church pushes in the opposite direction they feel like visual arts visual anything within the church is just too closely related to um, corruption and idolatry and they want they don't want they don't want 
that. They don't want to be reminded of that. So they push off and um, in the direction of focusing on the word, the written word of God. Um, they include music too. Obviously, that still maintains something. But uh, we have this shift. And fun fact, if you go into any museum or gallery that is housing, in the, in, basically in the world, that's housing art from this period of time, Renaissance and beyond, or at least the Renaissance for sure, the history that you, art history that you study in classes and um, the ones that are familiar that are coming to your mind from this time period, I guarantee you came from a Catholic country, um, not from a Protestant one. That's, that's, that says something, a little bit of our, our background here. So as the Renaissance comes to a close in the 1600s, there is a decline in religious uses of art. Um, and art begins to kind of uh, go off on its own and become secular. Um, so the real push of that is because the church was no longer uh, paying for art to be made. Um, they were no longer the sole kind of, they didn't have the, the monopoly, I guess, on like funding all of the arts. It was now royals and um, aristocratic elite that were, that were kind of the patrons of the art now. Um, and from there, it turned into what would be considered bourgeois art, which is more like the um, art became a luxury for people. And it was um, now in the open market, so it was now for sale. And this is also around the time, um, kind of like here-ish, where uh, galleries and museums, kind of the, the visual culture that we understand when consuming art, that's when that was taking shape as well. Um, so that idea also is continuing of the man being the center of, um, of the world and everything being, uh, being held up against that standard of our human experience. And in modernism, like at the, around the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we see th this even bigger push to demystify the world um, and to separate beauty from any divine source whatsoever. Um, even art that was characterized as spirit, quote unquote spiritual, um, so like Mark Rothko, um, a lot of abstract expressionism, expressionists had a very faith-based, or a very spiritual-based uh, practice. Um, again, in the art world, they're very, they're very um, separate about, uh, about spiritual art versus Christian art or, um, or pointing to any divine source whatsoever. Um, huge separation there. Um, and so that brings us kind of to now. I have We Are Here-ish because, um, you know, it's, it's ish. And this is a good representation of what happens after the, the early 20th century. Things within like 15 years go from realism to like complete abstraction. Um, I didn't even touch on like found art and like the, the, the irony of like, this is art. Like art is what I say it is. That mentality, it's all, that's all in, encompassed in that right there. Um, so. so that kind of brings us to now. Um, and uh, I, wanna, I wanna open it up just a little bit. We've got probably about five, 10 minutes that we can talk a little bit. I want your opinion on where you think we are right now, okay? So um, in, case, in case you didn't catch that, we, we kind of came off here. So our, our tradition of faith tends to not be um, heavy on the visual arts. Um, so the questions I ask are, where do you think we are now? Uh, what is your feeling on how visual culture and the church connect or don't connect? And what place does art have within the church? What place does the gospel have? Uh, does the gospel have in the art world um, kind of where you think these things mesh and I have thoughts but I want to I want to hear your thoughts maybe first yeah I just think of like just how visual we are as people I mean like you think of scripture so you know you hear like a mighty fortress is our God mm -hmm. you think of a fortress and, yeah. and you know growing up I didn't ever really like 
think of that, but like, you know, as I like study scripture more and like try to get out of what you were saying, getting out of like the Western <laughs> mind or whatever, <laughs> but like, it's like, you know, like picturing like what a fortress is and like then describing the fortress. It's like, oh, that's leading me to God more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, like, I think just naturally we do have, like, we are visual beings. And, Absolutely. Like, whenever you read scripture, it's hard not to, you know, put yourself, like, you know, think of, like, rivers or, like, like water or an ocean or, like, you visualize it, mm-hmm. you know? And I personally would like to see more art in, <laughs> in churches that isn't, like, a cross with an American flag behind <laughs> it, like, which yeah. is, you know, that, that's, like, a... Yeah, that, yeah, no, I get, I but, get what but you're like, saying. But, like, surely we can, like, be, do better than that. Like, is mm-hmm. that, like, that's not the only representation of yeah. the American church, like, because that's not the whole gospel. <laughs> Absolutely. So, like, that, that we, us being visual creatures has not changed. Right. Even though our culture kind of, because you know, that, like, split and changed. Because that, like, with, like, whatever it is in our churches, that's still creating an emotional response, but is that what we want? Right. Yep. Is that actually like representing the gospel? You yeah. Know? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, there's Did research out there that like art is used to understand these abstract and very hard to think about concepts. Like, mm-hmm. if we use art with that, we can better get a grasp when we take, you know, abstract thought and art, you know, two different parts of our brain and combine them, we're able to understand that realm so much better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wish that. Um, I was more like cerebral in being able to like, like I love the idea of knowing what happens in our brain when we view art, like what is that connection? It's beyond me, but I think it's cool. Chris? So this topic is kind of close to my heart too, as like a classically trained musician, Mm -hmm. thinking of those things, as the history of music and art parallel each other a lot. Mm -hmm. And the church started out like, they were the ones making strides in music and are, yeah. you know, like notating music and making the formal structures we know now. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel like it came from a place of like, how can we express our devotion mm-hmm. to God in like the most expressive and sincere and authentic way? And that like pushed the envelope of art and music. And now it's more like, like how can I fit within the place that won't offend anybody? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, just the yeah. limitation on expression has really stifled Christian art. Mm-hmm. So, so I feel like it's kind yeah. of a complicated question. Like that line that we've come off, like, we're kind of on it, but yeah. the quality I did. of that yeah. work is like yeah. way down. So. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we've sterilized God. Uh-huh. God's this creative being. And like you said, like art used to be so creative and music used to be amazing. And now Christian music is four chords usually (laughs) and like very basic art is very basic like and yeah we've sterilized all this into a very white kind of Mm -hmm. culture yeah yeah becca something i've been like thinking about is um just in our culture and this is primarily west back probably everywhere but um the level of toxicity Mm -hmm. and um the level of um like disunity and distrust and negativity and disruption and noise. Like I, I've been wrestling with the fact of like, okay, um, you know, our, you know, kind of first thought of response is like, okay, well, we need more peace or we need more uh, of the fruits of the spirit or whatever. But I've been wrestling with. I wonder if the antidote is like the antidote to that is beauty, not necessarily. Mm-hmm peace, even though it's part of it, and, mm. and that beauty is the antidote to just toxicity, whether it's um, visual toxicity or even just cultural toxicity that we have in each other, and, or have just because of whether it's social media, whatever it is, and, um, and that's needed for the church and the world, and, and the, the role, the healing, the beauty, how beauty, he, beauty heals, mm-hmm. I think, in some especially when you're the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. like, intention in which you create something, I feel like that that can like that can be the response that people feel when they see something. And so that's kinda of what I've been wrestling with as far as like yeah. the church and the world and Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't want to cut anyone off, but all these things are like Yeah, I'm gonna get just wait. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um I 
have some thoughts on this, um, and some of them might feel harsh, but also some of them I think I, I'm not one to, Adam keeps, Adam keeps telling people I'm not one to pull a punch. Um, so I'm just gonna say it, but um, I wanna preface by saying that um, I believe that art can be used by God to transform people, um, and that I, it can extend grace to the world and lead the church to worship. Um, I also believe that art, the art world could gain a depth of content that it is seeking if artists were able to discover the deep things of God. Um, but currently, this is kind of where I see things at. Um, the art world is hostile towards religious beliefs and the hypocrisy that they associate with the church. And the church is suspicious of the art world. That feels alien to many people. Um, and they can tend to show a moral superiority and rage um, that keeps it at arm's length um, in response to like the creations that they see within the art world. Um, and I added a little aside, um, or they simply view it as not essential or are indifferent to its presence in general. Um, so while I think that there have been really great strides made in, uh, within the church to bring back visual arts um, into our services and buildings and faith practices, and of course, I'm speaking from a point of visual arts because that's my thing, but absolutely this encompasses music, this encompasses writing, um, definitely broader than that, but yeah. Um, but we've made some strides. Some things have gotten better, I think. I think people are um, beginning to s remember the importance of beauty. Um, but there are still three hurdles that I think we have to overcome. One is that financial support of the visual arts is a hard sell within the church. It's a hard sell within secular education, <laughs> let alone then also the church. Um, and. If there, are, if there is a, a visual culture within the church, it's not excellent. Mm -hmm. Call it like I see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second hurdle I think we have is that uh, the nature of the art world is very antagonistic towards Bible-believing Christians, mm -hmm. which limits our influence in the art world currently. Um, I went to graduate school uh, at Eastern for art and um, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say that I was overly uh, vocal about my faith, but it came out in what I was doing. Um, and it was, it was neither uh, recognized or uh, argued. It was like a, they just look over it. They just ignore it, just talk about all the other things but the faith elements within my art were like a non-presence. Um, it's rough. Um, so yeah, that limits our influence that we can have as Christians in the art world. Um, and the third hurdle is that somewhere along the way, the church associated this idea of beauty with things of this world. Um, so I have some ideas for how we can, how art can engage the world with the gospel. Um, and uh, the first one uh, addresses the church. I think the church needs to find the balance, that balance between excellence and multiplication. Uh, we got the multiplication thing down, right? We understand discipleship. We've got, we understand like, like we understand that model. Um, uh, but it kind of, it, it tends to be one or the other, right? We, I'm going to use worship arts as an example because it's the thing, it's the art form that's currently the most popular in our churches, okay? So uh, we tend to have worship that is either really good, but it's only a few people that are contributing to it, um, which is what makes it good. Uh, or we have a wide range of people that are involved in doing it, um, which is great. It's like getting more people together and involved, but the quality is um, not excellent. And um, my husband's reading a book right now called Hero Maker, and in it, it talks about how excellence and multiplication need to start working as like two pedals of a bicycle. We need to get into that rhythm 
of focusing on both of those elements. Um, and so an example of that might be that uh, you know, we have those people that are really good at what they do, that, that bring that element of excellence, and that as they're doing visual arts or worship arts, that they're bringing people in to see their process and to learn and to become better. Um, and almost like apprenticeships, um, bringing those back into place with our craft, not just in discipleship and multiplication in that, in that way. Um, we uh, need spaces made for this within the walls of the church beyond just worship arts. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that is gonna happen. I don't know what that looks like, but that's, that's that. Uh, the second way that I think that uh, art can engage the world with the gospel is that we artists, if you identify as an artist in here, I'm going to talk to you at one point, but just in general, also Christ followers, uh, we need to reconcile beauty. We need to get it back to what God intended it to be, not what the world has said it is. Um, we need to reclaim that which is lost and broken and bring hope and truth and love to those places. And to start, we need to be reminded of what visual beauty is. So we've kind of already touched on these things, but I'm gonna just remind us of what beauty is. Beauty and creativity and art are expressions of God and his divine nature. And our desire to create is an avenue of worship. Um, I think Chris was kind of talking on that, like like out of out of the things we make, we our intention is, oh, it was Becca that said that. Our intention is to glorify God with those things. Um, and we need to remember that art is a powerful language that can engage the mind, the senses, the heart, the soul. It leads us to contemplate deeper parts of life. And it can be an incredible uh, tool to process and express your emotions, uh, even like art therapy programs that they have. I mean, it, art is an incredible tool. Um, art often confronts us with the gap that exists between what the world is now and what it can and will be. So I know that sounds really kind of like frou frou -y, but uh, like why do truly breathtaking things bring tears to our eyes? Um, why does intense beauty actually hurt a little bit? And it's because exquisite art reacquaints us with our incompleteness and it awakens us for the hunger that we have for more. Mm. Um, art is metaphorical. It always generates a surplus of meaning. It's ambiguous and open to interpretation. It encourages the audience to think and feel. And while it opens up for interpretation, it resolves nothing, uh, which allows people a chance to sit and contemplate. And much like approaching a parable in scripture, uh, when you approach art, you ask, what does it do? Good art can inspire, comfort, disturb. Uh, make you feel something, it can make you care. Uh, it can encourage, admonish, inform, confront, uplift, uh, so much more. Uh, I love this quote from Jeremy Begbie in his book, Resounding Truth. He said, a great story or painting or dance can challenge our assumptions that the world is something that we can master because it confronts us with the reality that the universe and the God who made it is inexhaustible. And last but not least, my favorite, my favorite part of art, I think, uh, is that art reminds us that usefulness is not the measure of worth. Mm. Usefulness is not the measure of worth. Mm. So as artists, if there are artists in the room, if you identify as an artist, uh, we need to be bringing this mindset into the art world. We can't just wait for churches to open up creative director positions and then move into that spot. We have to get out there in the art world. We have to create content that is beautiful and excellent and authentic and that reflects the character of God so that it can be a blessing to the world. And as Christ followers, uh, we need to be intentional about bringing this mindset uh, of beauty into our faith practices and communities. So creating beauty through relationships and discovering beauty in the mundane, those are, those are pretty easy ways for us to, um, for us to kind of bring that into our, our lives. Even if, even if this idea of creating beauty and um, visual culture, even if that feels 
like hard for you, um, or like like ooh, that's outside of my comfort zone. Um, you can you can foster beauty in relationships, and you can um, you can be looking for beauty in mundane places and mundane tasks. Um, but in case that's not enough, I have a little list of some practical ways. Um, this list actually came from an article that I read uh, that was on bringing visual art practices into like and pairing them with spiritual the practicing of spiritual disciplines so these like go great alongside of like practicing solitude or stillness or um, lots of lots of things but these are these are some some just suggestions so um, listen careful or listen with listen careful listen with careful attention to a type of music that you might not otherwise listen to um, what's happening with the instruments uh, is there more than one melody happening at once uh, if there are words ask yourself if the music is saying the same thing that the that the words are are saying um, just sit and contemplate it and think about it um, Another idea is visit an art gallery. I know that feels, uh, how many of you are intimidated at the idea of walking into an art gallery? Some people might not be, but some people are, okay? If this is intimidating to you, I'm gonna give you a secret of what I do when I'm in an art gallery, and it's this. Wander through slowly and find a painting that you're drawn to, and then look at it for two minutes. Just look at it. Up close, far away. Just look at it, and uh, do you see anything that you didn't see right away at the, from the beginning? Or um, uh, is, what is it that drew you into it? Is it the subject matter? Is it the colors? Is it the line work? Just think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then do the same thing with another piece that you find horrifying. <laughs> Ask the same questions. There you go. That's what I do when I'm in an art gallery. <laughs> uh, it can be a great way of slowing down and paying attention and um, letting a, a, a piece of visual work speak to you, which I like to think is a way that God can speak to me as well. Um, another idea is make a meal that as artfully as you can possibly as you possibly can, using fresh whole ingredients and spices, invite your friends and family over to eat it and serve it on your very best china. Um, read the poem "As Kingfishers Catch Fire" by Gerald Manley Hopkins every day for a week, and this article says that after day three, you're allowed to Google the poem to learn more about its meaning. Um, and uh, do you know an artist? I promise you that I didn't write this, though it sounds really self-gratifying, self but do you know an artist? Uh, see if you can buy her a coffee, this is what it says. <laughs> but I'm not gonna turn it down. Uh, ask what inspires her, ask her to teach you one thing about their craft that you possibly don't know. Um, campus ministers, you can do this with any art students or creative students that you have within your ministry. And while you're talking with them um, and asking them about that, ask them how they can um, bring their creativity into your ministry. If I guarantee you they have ideas. Can you read uh, that one over again? Yes. Uh, asking the, if you know an artist, buy her a coffee. Um, and then I s specifically suggested uh, asking her to teach you one thing about their craft that you possibly don't know. And campus ministers do this with any art students that you may have and ask them if they have any suggestions on how they can bring their creativity into your ministry. Um, if you're part of a local church, uh, ask your church worship leaders to consider an idea of adding, including another art form within the worship service, whether that be sculpture or dance, or this article suggested even adding the addition of a scent to the worship time. Um, do you guys have any other ideas of ways that we can uh, practically experience and practice that, like re that reclaiming of beauty in in our day to day? Yeah. So from the music side, there's like the difference of like art or music to be observed and like music to be participated in. So like hymns were created from bar songs, you know, to teach. I mean, church people, Christian theology, 
And so like the worship music we sing is very accessible and that's really good that we can participate in worship together. But there's also music of like playing, you know, Chopin. Or there's like beauty in playing something truly artistic and more virtuosic and expressive. And so from the music side of like I used to make fun of the special music at a lot of churches. <laughs> but <laughs> explaining the value of observing art in that way. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's just something I was personally convicted of during this. Of yeah. Like, Maybe I should stop making fun of special music. <laughs> oh, man. Apparently, they all want you to to share information. <laughs> this is a safe space. <laughs> if you have something to share, you can, but you don't have to. You've got to have something. I have Maybe a dissertation that you wrote. Kristen is extremely um, artistic and. Uh, she, she wrote a dissertation on art space a theorist. So she uh, has, um, uh, she is, and she loves human anatomy. Mm -hmm. and so uh, Kristen lived in my home and uh, in an apartment. And uh, after she moved out, I went in to do some painting. And this is very interesting. I, I found asked Lowell first. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's great. I, and I wish now I had taken picture of it. Do you have a picture of it? It was a picture of, I think it's a tree and then a <laughs> human heart. I mean, you know, uh -huh. a real, uh -huh. not just like the heart that we right, see. Right, right, like the actual, organ. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. An organ. Yes. That's awesome. With, uh, some type of um, poem or something next, next mm -hmm. to it. So mm -hmm. she is very uh, creative and yeah. expressive that way and and uh, writes, uh, her poetry is always published and very into human anatomy. I'm so glad I didn't have to awesome. do this for you. Yeah. Um, Did you paint over it? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Teach you. Yeah, I need permission. Yeah, that's fine. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah, no, yeah. that's fine. It's not, and they have to yeah. move on to That's fine. Me. That's just called life. I think the what I would say based on that, mm -hmm. yes, I did paint <laughs> an anatomical wall mural yep. at Lola Katie's house. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and it's beautiful though. I'm not saying it was yeah. beautiful. Right. Yeah, so so I, I am really inspired by anatomy. If you read anything I've written or anything that I've painted or created, mm -hmm. it's it usually has some element of that in it because yeah. I'm just fascinated by the humanistic aspect of mm -hmm. art, mm -hmm. and just that God, like, I love what you were saying, like, it, art reminds us that usefulness is not the measure of worth, because above all, regardless of what the art is about, God instilled that mm -hmm. in us, mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Yeah, we have to use our skills and abilities. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you if you have any ideas of how a church can do? I liked that question as it relates to your insight. <laughs> I mean, the answer is you don't have anything. I just want to, you're not going to say anything if somebody doesn't ask you, and I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I think, uh, well, I, I just think churches that we've been involved with in the past have just not necessarily placed that value on creativity, unfortunately, because, I mean, mm -hmm. I appreciated the timeline you had and just being able to see that, like, visually played out mm -hmm. when that happened. Yeah. But I think one of the things that we can do is just, as artists and creators, we can help try to facilitate bringing that back into those spaces because it's been absent for so long and just sharing with people that, you know, because I'm sure you hear this from people all the time that they say they're not creative yes. or like I don't have those abilities yeah. or something like that. Yeah, no, and I don't like, like that. I think as people of faith, you've been told that mm -hmm. or maybe you haven't been given the opportunity mm -hmm. to do that. So I just think as artists and creators in faith spaces, mm -hmm. we can help facilitate bringing that back in by creating vulnerable safe spaces for people to come in and practice these crafts. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
I crossed so many lines that it was totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did it. It's, it's true what you say about uh, people always say, well, I'm not creative, I'm not creative. And I, I, I know, like, biblically speaking, that's false. You are creative. Um, and, like, have any, has anyone seen the old television show Numbers? It's, like, about a, like, math, crazy, brainy mathematician and his brother's, like, an FBI agent, and they solve crimes together. Well, like, I am not, I do not like math. My brain just doesn't grab onto numbers the way that it grabs onto pictures. So I, I don't understand it. And I always thought, like, that's not a creative profession, you know. But then I'm watching this TV show, of all things, and I'm like, Whoa, math is incredibly creative. Like coming up with an alg and again I know it's a TV show, but coming up with an algorithm that can help like find the patterns that these criminals are making without even knowing that they're making them, like that's insane. Um, there are professions that are incredibly creative, even if they're not visually creative um, or aesthetically creative. Um, developing sewer systems. I don't know who did that, but that's like that's an intense amount of creativity put to use solving a problem and figuring out a way to execute it in a way that keeps people safe and it's like a tangled web of I mean like it's it's insane it's incredibly creative so there is there is um, everyone is creative I think not creative, yeah I'm sorry. no no go ahead go ahead creativity takes practice mm -hmm. and I feel like sometimes we don't want to put the practice into being creative to learn something new and practice at it. We think mm -hmm. if we're, we're such an uh, instantaneous, mm -hmm. you know, well, I can't do it perfect the first time, then I must, that must not be my bag. Right. But instead of like practicing mm -hmm. and taking the time to be creative and enjoying the process yes. of the creativity. It's the thing I love the most about art. I always tell people, you might not naturally be gifted in drawing a perfect hand or eye or whatever it may be, but you can learn. Yeah. Art can be learned. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the beauty of that like idea of apprenticeships and teaching and multiplying in that way is that this is something that we can bring people on and teach them. And, and it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea learning how to paint or draw or whatever it may be. But, um, but yeah, there's that, there is that ability to learn, uh, learn that skill. Well, yeah. We don't value like the reason why there's also like this immediate guilt that you feel when you engage in something creative because yes. it's not productive. Yes. There's no quantitative value to it. And so if I'm going to practice something, but I know it's going to reap productive value, well, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. But I already feel guilty for wanting to paint. Oh, absolutely. So how dare I put more effort into learning how to, because I'm already wasting precious kingdom value. You just explained the last three weeks of my life, like the internal struggle that I've been going through, like how, how can I justify spending money on these expensive materials when our culture views art as just an extra thing? It's just, you know, if you have enough money in the budget and you want to like get something nice, you know, you could do that, but don't, don't spend a lot of money on someone that's really good and, and doing something custom for you, you know, just go down to the store, grab something that's, you know, and not to knock store art because there's some beautiful things out there too, but it makes, it does create a conflict within the artist's heart of like how, how necessary is what I'm doing. Um, and that's, I love this um, because mm -hmm. like if nothing else, I'm modeling my own worth and value in, in God. <laughs> like he, he views me as, as, worthy and as valuable, regardless of whether I have a function or not. Um, that was also something that happened, that distinction between art and craft, um, that happened um, during the Renaissance as well. Um, and art was something that was just, had value for its own sake. And craft became this, um, something that had a social function to it. Um, so. I got a question, kind of backing yeah. up, and I apologize for us ruining. No, you're fine. You're fine. Going off real. So actually, both you two can help me out with this. So I've been not necessarily in an argument, but in an argument <laughs> with the church, whose uh, stance on worship is we don't want to be 
like a show. We don't want to be a rock show. We don't want to have the excellence to make it look like it's a concert or anything like that. And so they, they go to the part of, well, we like having mistakes and having wrong chords and it grades me. What would your response for that be to be like, no, like an excellence is good. It's like showing God. Like, <laughs> I, I've been toying with this idea a little bit too because I feel like how would I how would I pitch this to a church like how would I make them see that this is important and I think um, what's hard is that our perspective our perspectives it, it comes down to motivation what are they what are they hoping to accomplish through this worship service um, are they too afraid that uh, all we're going to see is a rock show or are they expecting worship to just be, I don't know, what it always is instead of what it could be, which is um, a really beautiful experience of God moving. And I think people assume that the more bells and whistles that you have in a service, then that means that you're really just trying to pull people in, you're trying to be flashy. They keep that, that association of what the world does with art and visual culture, they're placing the world's view of visual culture onto the church. And really we need to retrain our way of understanding beauty and its purpose and, and why we have beautiful things in our spaces and knowing that that motivation is so that we hope it reflects God, not us. That, this is another thing about like artists in the church. Um, I think that artists within, if, if I'm, if I'm, displaying my art in a church. I just, a few weeks ago, our local church had this like artist spotlight and they had artists come in and bring their work to put on the walls of, of the church. And there was some tension of like, well, do we like put prices out in case people want to buy it? Do we like put a little blurb about you in case people want to go and like uh, know more about you? And uh, we, they kind of settled on just having like a small bur blurb off to the corner with a QR code that people could scan if they wanted more information. Um, but I kind of started thinking about that of like, okay, I think as an artist, my job is to create things that is is for the benefit of the of the church body, for the edification of the church, not for my own glory and my own uh, my own like bolstering of ego and for my own benefit. So, um, when it comes to worship, we always tell our students: if you're on stage worshiping, this isn't about you. This is about leading people into worship. And honestly, the most the most beautiful times of worship are when the music is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, that I can ignore the musicians and the things that are happening on the stage and just like experience the excellence, yeah. right? Like it's distracting when it sucks. Yes. And I have a hard time focusing on worship because I'm so distracted by how terrible it is. I mean, that's, that's harsh, but that's like the reality of that. So I think in excellence, they're actually be is a greater freedom to worship correctly. Um, I, like I like your balance of beauty and multiplication because the one thing that far out, there's no balance. None. We care about multiplication. There's, yes. There's very little value on beauty. Yes. Uh, unless it helps multiplication. And then all of a sudden, I'm kind of, you know, then it's tell me more. important, um, right? <laughs> but that to see those things as equally. Mm -hmm. I think one area of excellence and multiplication that I have seen is that uh, Bible study booklets and devotional apps have gotten pretty. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, that's a step. But again, the focus is multiplication and making that really, really good, making that tool really, really perfect, you know? Um, it's such a struggle, too. Because I. As soon as COVID hit, the church I was helping out with, they went online. They wanted me to help them out. And the guy was like, no, just turn some lights on and we'll do it in my office. I'm like, no, we're going like, to have a backdrop. We're going to have perfect lighting. We're going to make it great. He's like, that's just wasting time. We're just going to like record it. And again, in those situations, when you're viewing a video that's done really well, you're not paying attention to, wow, that lighting is perfect. Right. Or, oh my goodness, that would, the sound was just perfectly clear. Like you're focused in on, on what's being said, right. you know? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, you had something. Um, I just wanted to bring up the chosen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of people. I'm excited um, watching that and then just feel like it's, all, it's taking that idea of excellence and really um, try to show the world mm -hmm. that you can be a Christian and make something excellent. Yeah. Um, it, it's really, really well done. And yeah. I really hope that it's kind of a catalyst that yeah. brings more of that level mm -hmm. of creativity. That's awesome. That's kind of how I feel about the Bible Project. Yes, too. Bible Project, um, absolutely. Just yeah, like I love that resource. Their video on, on God. Mm -hmm. um, just the way that they take an abstract idea, if mm -hmm. the idea of God is abstract. Right, but yeah, yeah. Putting it into to our minds, at least. Like a piece of art that yeah. I really like. Mm -hmm. I think I, I could have watched the video without even the, the dialogue over it, yes. and I would have been like yeah. enmeshed mm -hmm. in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's cool, kind of like The Chosen and, like, the Bible. So, like, mm -hmm. using new means mm -hmm. of, like, just using technology mm -hmm. to produce quality art. It's, mm -hmm. like, really encouraging. Yeah, um, super encouraging. And it's exciting because, like, you know, like, we're, like, one of you were saying, like, we're all creative. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just we might not all be able to draw mm -hmm. an eye. <laughs> and right. I, like, right. but that doesn't mean I'm, like, because I can't draw to say that. Like, I'm, like, a stick figure yeah. guy. But I like to think I'm a pretty creative person. Uh -huh. like I like woodworking. Uh -huh. I like storytelling. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's exciting to see, like, these new methods of, of art. I mean, it's, it yeah. is art. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah. I, yeah. Echoing. There's a, there's a church in Indy um, that has done some pretty fantastic things in the movement of visual arts and creating that kind of visual culture out of the church. Um, Redeemer Church is the name of it, and they are connected to the Harrison Center, used to be Harrison Center for the Arts. Um, but it is um, it is a place, like the, the, the Harrison Center is connected to Redeemer Church. So like you go in one door and it's like this gorgeous, architecturally just incredible space, old church building, you know, that has like all that like beautiful character and um, charm about it uh, and then you go through a set of doors and you're in the Harrison Center um, which is a place they house like 30 to 35 artist studios within that space they've got multiple gallery spaces and it started off as like a small thing and it has developed into like a massive neighborhood neighborhood cultural center that has um, guest speakers come in they do uh, cultural and art like installations throughout the neighborhoods uh, they encouraged over this last year, they were doing um, something called porch parties where uh, they just encourage people to gather on porches um, and do activities together or just talk or hang out, spend time, share a meal. Um, they, uh, they just do, they do things really, really well. And the emphasis is on uh, just creating, creating good culture good art, good uh, connections and relationships and fostering that. And they started a school that is in collaboration with Heron School of Art. I mean, it's just really, they look into that place. I've been there and it, they're doing a really fantastic job. And the church itself is bringing then, is like kind of has this partnership with all the artists that it houses to like bring some of those things and have those uh, pieces of art on display so that it can be part of their services. And um, it's just really, it's really a beautiful picture of what, of what could be, not that they're doing it perfect, but it's a, it's a good start if nothing else. So, um, um, okay, last thought real fast. I know we're like over by a minute, but um, I wanted to just extend that I can, I'm can. i happy to be a resource in this area. If you have more questions, uh, if you are wanting to take steps and just don't know how and want to like ask specifically about your ministry or your context, whatever that may be, um, if you have um, students who are art majors and you're like, I don't even know what to do with them. Like, I'm happy to be like a mentor, even if it's virtually um, or or kind of be able to have conversations if you have students that that would be helpful for. Um, yes. And then if anyone needs any more detailed information, I have this that I can send. So just let me uh, connect with me and I can I can send it your way. But let me just pray to close real fast. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time and this conversation. Um, I thank you for beauty. 
Um, I thank you for um, our partnership that we get to uh, be creators. Thank you for, um, for trusting that to us. Uh, I pray that we would um, find a way to uh, glorify you in, um, in our gifts and our, our abilities, God. Um, we love you and we just give you the rest of our day. Um, it's in Jesus' name, amen.